2012. Today we're joined by an extremely special guest speaker, Mr. John Mrs. Jonathan Portis. Mr. Jonathan Portis studied maths at Oxford University and then went on to study a master's degree at Princeton. He then worked in the civil service, he worked in the treasury, as well as the cabinet office. He is now the director of an extremely established institute of uh, research. Their vision is to apply expertise um, in economic and social uh, issues to current debates and to influence policy. His main areas lie in labour markets and migration poverty and uh, international economic and social issues. So put your hands together and welcome Mr. Jonathan Coulter. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, so I'll talk probably for, I don't know, half an hour or so uh, um, uh, before, uh, and then we can have questions and, and general discussion. Uh, I know that was a very kind summary of my career. Uh, I, a bit more background perhaps, I, you know, I, I, did, um, I, I did study maths at Oxford. Um, and actually, um, I did do a master's degree at Princeton, but I didn't do it straight away. When I finished university, uh, I didn't really have any idea of what I wanted to do, uh, to be absolutely honest. Uh, so I, I knew I was interested in, in politics and, and, and in philosophy, uh, sorry, politics and, and, and policy, and, and you know how uh, um, how you know a government could. Uh, make this country a better place. So uh, I applied for the examinations to join the civil service, um, and I joined the treasury um, straight after uh, uh, after university. Uh, and so I worked there for a few years on a whole bunch of different things, um, including policy about social security and welfare benefits, policy about the European Union, tax policy, uh, and indeed I even spent uh, a year and a half uh, working for the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, in his private office as a speechwriter, so I wrote uh, I wrote speeches for a while um, and did other sort of stuff for, relating to, to his public uh, engagements. Uh, but after a, a few years of being in the Treasury and working on on uh, you know a, a variety of really fascinating problems about public policy uh, and how policy ought to be made, I realised that. Um, um, economics uh, underlay a lot of what I was trying to think about and trying to deal with. And so I, it was only at that point that I went off uh, um, and did a master's degree uh, uh, in, uh, in economics and public policy. Um, so I, it, it took me a while to work out uh, what, I, what I wanted to do and what I needed to do uh, um, in order to, uh, uh, to make my way. Uh, so. Uh, after that, then I came back and, and I uh, and I rejoined the civil service, uh, but this time more as a sort of a, 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 as an economist, uh, 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 working on on again on a, a variety of things. One of the great things about working in the civil service, I found, was that you got um, the opportunity to try your hand at a, a huge variety of, of public policy problems. Um, so I've worked on everything from uh, um, oil and energy uh, through to um, immigration policy uh, through to uh, how do you get lone parents into jobs uh, through to uh, how do you measure child poverty and what do you do about it. Uh, so uh, uh, and, and then uh, um, and, and on various things relating to uh, um, to international financial issues. So I was in, uh, I was lucky enough, uh, uh, and it was mostly a matter of luck rather than planning, uh, to be uh, um, the chief economist at the cabinet office uh, uh, um, and working with uh, with Number Ten Downing Street as the prime minister um, at the time of the international financial crisis in 2008. Um, so I had a, a sort of a ringside seat. In the uh, the biggest economic crisis uh, in my lifetime, certainly, um, whether it will be the biggest economic crisis in your lifetimes uh, uh, remains to be seen. Of course, uh, 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 we'll see. Um, but and all that's why I really said, you know, I, I think I've had a, a um, and, and then after the, a, a few years after that, in 2011 or so, I left government and, and went to 
to the National Institute, uh, where, uh, which is a rather different job in the sense that instead of making policy, I'm much more commenting on it and analyzing it from outside, uh, writing about it uh, in everything from academic research papers uh, through to commenting on, uh, on, on the media, on the radio and TV, occasionally writing for, for newspapers like the, the Guardian or, or so on. If any of you have picked up, uh, um, there's a free paper called City AM, which some of you may have seen, uh, which is handed out around London every morning. Uh, and there was an article, an article by me uh, in that uh, in, in this morning, uh, written jointly with a, uh, um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I disagree, a, a friend and fellow economist who I disagree with about a lot of things. Uh, so, uh, actually, I'll tell you about this because it is, it is sort of interesting. It doesn't quite relate to what I'm going to talk about. So, about, um, uh, um, uh, about three years ago now, uh, the figures for inflation have just come out. And inflation was, at that point, a little bit above the government's target. It was running at about 2.5%. Um, but the economy wasn't doing very well. Um, and there was a bit of a, there was a discussion on Twitter, which I use quite a lot, uh, between me and a number of other economic commentators on whether inflation was going to go up or down. Um, and my friend, uh, um, Andrew, uh, said, if growth comes back, inflation will go above 5%, betcha. Um, and I said, again on Twitter, I'll take that bet. Uh, so, uh, so we concluded a bet uh, which was for a thousand pounds because if you're going to do, if you're going to make a bet, you have to do it enough so that it actually matters. Um, so we bet uh, that, uh, but it was for quite a long period. We bet not that inflation would go up or down that month, but that inflation, that after growth came back in 18 months, Andrew thought inflation would be five percent. Uh, I thought it would be more like two percent. Um, and actually the bet came due yesterday, so the inflation figures were out yesterday. Um, and inflation actually, uh, as of yesterday, was, there was no inflation at all, it was negative. Inflation was negative, minus, was negative 0.1%. Um, so, uh, uh, so I won the bet, um, which was nice. <laughs> um, uh, I did give the money to charity. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 the interesting thing, no, and, and this is what the article that Andrew and I read in the uh, in City AM this morning says. The interesting thing is not so much that I won the bet. Uh, the interesting from the economic point of view is why, uh, what happened, uh, what did Andrew get wrong, and not only what did Andrew get wrong, but what did I get wrong? Because although I won the bet, that doesn't mean that I was right about everything. And in fact, uh, I wasn't right about uh, a number of things, uh, as I said in the article. Uh, and I think that that. Um, the, the, the bed illustrates, and, and again, this is the point of article, the article, a number of things. Um, first of all, that, uh, that forecasting is very, very difficult, uh, especially when it's about the future. Uh, you, you know, economic forecasting is not a science uh, in the sense that, say, physics is a science. Equally, it's not about art or guesswork. It's about making informed judgments, judgments that are informed by economics and statistics, and learning from them. Uh, learning from what goes right or wrong, and recognizing that there can be no precision because economics is ultimately about how, uh, uh, how human beings interact in, a various, in various ways, um, through generally through, but not always through markets. Um, and that's uh, um, partly about numbers and statistics, but it's all partly about, uh, 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 to a very large extent, about psychology and about how human beings interact with each other. Um, and that is not a uh, something that you can always be certain about because it changes how human beings interact, it uh, changes over time. So predictions about the future are always uncertain. Uh, but you can, but that doesn't mean they're not useful, it doesn't mean you can learn from them. Um, the second thing we learned, which, uh, 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 which I think uh, a number of people recognized and commented on uh, um, in the media yesterday about this bet, was that it's a good discipline, nonetheless, to be able to put numbers and dates on your predictions. Uh, so you can learn when you get wrong. If I say to you, well, I'm pretty sure, you know, there's going to be another recession, you know. Uh, there's going to be a financial crisis. Um, well, maybe I could come back here in five years or, or meet some of you in five years and 
Either they're a will have been one, in which case I'll say, yeah, I was right. There was one a year and a half ago or two and a half years ago. Or I could say, you know, you just have to wait. Well, it, it's coming. It's coming. It'll be next year. Um, if you're not precise about dates, times, and predict, you know, about precise about your predictions, then they're, then they're not worth anything. There are lots of people who will tell you that the UK economy is heading into a bubble um, and it's all going to end in tears. Um, and in some sense, they're probably right. At some point, it will all end in tears because uh, uh, there are periodic financial crises. But it's not very useful um, and it's not really very good economics just to say, well, there's going to be another financial crisis because uh, all this is is unsustainable. You actually have to be able to explain why and what that means in concrete terms if you want it to be useful to anybody. Um, and as I said before, the, the third thing that, that we learned is that after you've made a prediction and you've seen what happens to it, you have to go back and analyze it, work out uh, why you were right or wrong, uh, um, what happened, what were the mechanisms. So I was right that inflation would still be low today. And partly that was because of, that, because of things that I could never, uh, I didn't anticipate, like you know, the fact that uh, um, uh, the oil prices have fallen so sharply, and that, that wasn't really part of my prediction. Uh, so that was just luck. Um, partly, though, I was right, and Andrew was wrong, um, that the UK economy could grow relatively healthily without sparking off inflation, that there was lots of people and uh, spare capacity out there ready to be used. Um, and then, uh, uh, um, but also I was wrong about another thing, uh, which was that I thought that when growth would come back, that wages would rise quite quickly. Um, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, that's what we've seen in previous recoveries. And now on that, I was completely wrong. Uh, wages have been very low. Uh, wage growth has been very low in this country for the last few years. And that's almost unprecedented uh, uh, in a recovery. Uh, it doesn't happen, or it hasn't happened up to now. Uh, so there, there is a challenge uh, uh, to both Andrew and me. What is it that we don't understand? What's changed in the economy? Why is wage growth um, in the UK, which has historically plodded along uh, uh, um, quite, uh, uh, quite well at 2% two, two a year, so quite steadily uh, for a very long time, why did it suddenly go away uh, uh, about seven years ago? And is it going to come back? And if, it, you know, and if so, why? If not, why not? Um, so those are some of the sort of questions that I grapple with, successfully or not, uh, um, in my uh, uh, my day-to-day -day work. So now, but now I'm going to move on to, to this presentation. Um, so this is about uh, um, the subject which I'm concentrating on most at the moment, uh, very much because it is the subject that is uh, really probably the most important question uh, for both uh, the UK economy and indeed UK politics over the next two years. Uh, are we going to leave the European Union? There will almost certainly be a referendum on whether or not we're going to leave the European Union um, in uh, probably about a year or to 18 months. Uh, and this is really quite a big deal. The UK decided to join, uh, the, European join the European Union in the early 1970s, um, and there was a referendum uh, in 1975 on whether we should stay in. At that point, we hadn't been in very long, so, uh, uh, so it was really at that point that we made a choice. Um, I was nine years old then and uh, um, didn't really know what was going on. Uh, and since then, we haven't had a referendum, we haven't had that decision. Uh, but over those uh, um, 40 years, uh, our membership of the European Union has had a profound impact on the development of the British economy. Uh, and that is everything in, uh, th that affects everything in, uh, from uh, uh, where your clothes are made, probably, probably uh, if you look at the labels on, on, uh, uh, on your clothes, you'll find that many of them are made in places, uh, um, for example, in Portugal, uh, which of course is also part of the European Union, that's because Portugal is a low cost uh, textile producer within the European Union. Um, this area, of course, East London used to be uh, 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 a place which produced lots of clothes. Um, it doesn't much anymore. Uh, that's because of the way international trade has developed over the last couple of hundred years. But, but over the last 40 years, we've seen quite a large shift to uh, production in, in uh, places like Portugal and, and also in Bangladesh, which has a, uh, a special arrangement with the European Union which lets it export uh, clothes to the EU with relatively low tariffs. Um, 
Uh, so the EU had an effect there. It's also had an effect uh, um, on who we are. Uh, the population over the last uh, 10 years, um, the uh, population of East London has changed quite a lot. Uh, and one of the, the, the notable new developments has been uh, um, the arrival of quite a large number of Eastern Europeans. Uh, uh, there are probably uh, uh, um, uh, one or two, uh, at least in the class here, people of East European background. Uh, but in uh, um, uh, 10 or 12 years, as uh, those people who came, uh, you know, we, we know that, that, that those people who, who came from Eastern Europe are now having lots of children, their own children here. Um, over 10 or, in 10 or 15 years, there'll be quite a few more Eastern European uh, uh, kids in, in a class like this. Um, and again, that is a consequence of free movement of workers uh, within the European Union, uh, one of the fundamental principles, uh, um, but it wasn't uh, nobody here, I think, uh, when we joined in 1975, uh, no one quite anticipated that joining the European Union would lead to the, uh, the large Polish, Lithuanian, um, and so on communities that we now have in, in large parts of London. So, members of the European Union has changed us a lot, and leaving the European Union would be a really, a really big deal. It's one of those once in a generation choices for the country. Uh, so, there are, now there's a lot of politics about that. How should the country be governed? Uh, what is the, the right? Uh, uh, a way in which a, a democracy and an advanced industrialized country should function uh, in the international arena, how much of our sovereignty should we cede to international bodies like the EU. Uh, obviously, that, that's not my, quite my area. I'm going to talk about uh, um, uh, the economics. Uh, and it, it isn't just about the economics. Um, but very much like the Scottish referendum last, uh, last year, I think you'll find that, that much, if not most, of the debate, um, public debate, is about the economics. Um, and when uh, 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 the, uh, the, the campaigns, uh, both were in and out, launched earlier this week, which you may have seen on, your, on, on the news, uh, um, and uh, uh, there was quite a lot of discussion in the news and, 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 and the papers about the launch of the campaigns, um, you'll see that they did uh, although there is talk about uh, uh, democracy and, and so on, uh, a lot of what they talked about was indeed about the economic impacts of either being in or staying out. Um, and that, you know, as I said before, there are multiple issues uh, to be considered when, when thinking about the economics. Um, and there is an awful lot of noise and propaganda uh, from all sides. Uh, and, and here's an illustration. So uh, um, if you watch the campaign launch of Britain Stronger in Europe, uh, which is the campaign uh, led by uh, Lord Stuart Rose, who used to run Marks and Spencers, uh, for us to stay in. Um, he said that, uh, uh, that being in the European Union is worth £3,000 a year to every household. Um, meanwhile, on the other side, um, Vote Leave, which is one of the Get Us Out campaigns, said Britain sends up over £350 million to the European Union each week. Um, and then the other uh, Let's Get Us Out campaign, Leave EU, um, and uh, uh, like me, you probably have no idea how to tell the difference between Vote, Leave, and Leave EU, but at the moment there are basically two campaigns to get us out. Anyway, Leave EU uh, said that leaving the EU could make the average household £933 better off. Now, £933 is a suspiciously precise figure, but uh, 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 there you are. That's their calculation. Um, meanwhile, uh, um, the, the only relatively sensible thing I heard said on this topic uh, 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 was uh, Stephanie Flanders, um, who used to be the economics correspondent for the BBC, uh, uh, has now left. Uh, uh, now, she is part, I think, of the, the Let's Stay In campaign, uh, but nonetheless, uh, she was sensible enough to say that, that anyone who says they know uh, the impact uh, of leaving the, the European Union is, is lying, and, and she's quite right. So I'm not going to tell you what the, uh, the impacts are, I'm going to tell you some of the things that it's worth, uh, worth thinking about. But it's also important to, to think about why anyone who tells, says they know the, uh, uh, the impact of leaving the EU is lying, why that's the case. Um, uh, because it's a, something that comes up, a, a general principle that comes up in an awful lot of economic uh, uh, um, economic analysis. It goes back to what I was saying before about uh, um, 
economics and in particular economic forecasting being something in between a hard science and an art. It's a soft science or a social science. Um, it's because um, when you're talking about the future, um, you don't know the counterfactual. In other words, you don't know what would have happened. Um, you, you know, if you do something, you know what's going to happen, but if you don't do something, you don't know what would have happened if, uh, uh, if, if you've done it. Um, so, in particular, um, if we leave the EU, um, are we going to be worse off or better off? Well, that depends what happens. And why does it depend? You know, in what way does it depend? Well, it depends on what our arrangements are outside the, the European Union. There's no one certain future for the UK outside the European Union. Um, so, we could leave the European Union and stay, uh, uh, and then, uh, for example, as Norway has done, join something called the European Economic Area. That's sort of like an associate membership of the European Union. It has most of the costs and benefits of being in the European Union. So you still keep free trade, you still keep free movement of workers. Now I think most economists would say that, well if we did that, leaving the European Union would not have very much effect. Um, it would have some effect on politics and it would affect some things, but most of it actually, on the economics, not that much would change. In economic terms, Norway behaves very much as if it were a member of the European Union, even though it's not. On the other hand, we could leave the European Union and say, right, we're not going to have anything to do with those guys anymore. We're going to forget about Europe. We'll continue to trade with them a bit, but on the normal rules of anyone outside the European Union. And we'll try and build up our trade links with other countries, China, India, the US, whoever. Now, that's a very different future for the, Europe, for, for the UK. Um, and under those circumstances, um, our future would be very different. Would it be better or worse? Uh, I don't think we know yet. But what is certain, though, is that there is no one answer to the question of what would be the impact of leaving the European Union. It all depends very much on what happens to us, either if we stay in or stay out. Uh, and that's key when trying to evaluate the sorts of claims that are being made. But, um, despite all those uncertainties, um, it is possible um, to talk about what the key issues are uh, that, that we should think about when we're, we're discussing what the impacts of leaving the EU might be. Um, and here are six. Now, I'm not going to discuss all of these in detail, but I think it's important to recognize how, you know, just how important uh, the European Union is to the UK economy and our membership is, because it's not just about free trade. Um, when I was, uh, again, back when I was uh, 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 young and, and when this, the first referendum was held, um, we used to call the EU uh, the common market. Um, and that was because uh, people in this country thought, it, you know, it's a common market, it just means that, that there's more or less free trade between here uh, uh, and, and countries in, in, in continental Europe. Um, and that's still true, but it is now very much, the, what was the common market has gone through a number of name changes from the European, the, the, the common market to the European Economic Community, um, which still sounds as if it's mostly just about a very narrow type of economics, through to the European community, and now to the European Union, which of course has a much grander and more important sounding title. But that is for good reason, um, because the European Union affects much more than just trade. It affects how we regulate ourselves. It affects everything from how much your mobile phone company can charge you, for example, uh, um, both here and, and when you go uh, abroad, uh, through to um, the health and safety regulations uh, uh, um, that, that govern how uh, um, uh, this school, you know, the, the regulations that, that determine how, uh, you know, the energy efficiency of the light bulbs up there, um, through to how many hours a week uh, your teachers can work, or at least how many hours they're supposed to work, they probably work rather more than they're supposed to, um, all of those things. It, it covers investment, uh, um, both investment by public and private uh, uh, authorities and what the rules governing those are. As I said before, uh, labour mobility is perhaps the most visible aspect of, uh, uh, of what the EU means for us. Uh, it covers trade and financial services, which is much more complicated and technical than, than trade in ordinary goods. Um, and then, of course, uh, 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 we pay money into the European Union budget and we get some money back from it as well. 
uh, and that in turn goes to subsidize agriculture both here and abroad. Um, so, just uh, um, some statistics to illustrate how, how this matters. Um, so this uh, um, illustrates our exports uh, over the past 15 years. Um, and what you can see here is that, um, sorry, exports and imports. Uh, so we have uh, um, up here our um, Europe exports to the EU and exports outside the EU. Down here, imports from the European Union, imports from outside the European Union. Um, and so there's quite a lot in this chart, um, but what, what are the sort of key things that I would highlight? Um, the first of all is that um, overall our trade has grown very substantially. We're trading a lot more both with the European Union and outside the European Union, and we're both importing a lot more and exporting a lot more. In other words, the UK has become um, steadily a more globalized economy. We're more dependent on international trade uh, than we were um, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, the, um, the second thing is that uh, EU exports and imports make up a very large share uh, of UK trade. Uh, the EU is still by far our largest trading partner. Uh, about 45% of our exports go there. So it's hugely important. Uh, it's not the majority of our exports, but it's, uh, um, it's a very, very large share. Um, and the third point, and the point that's often discussed in, in these debates, is that um, over time, the share of our trade going to the European Union uh, has, uh, has gone down somewhat. So it's gone down from about 55% to 45%. So we're trading more with the rest of the world on a comparative basis. And there are two ways that people, the, uh, um, the politicians who are making the arguments for in or out, uh, can, uh, can spin that one. Uh, so the people who, uh, um, uh, the out campaign will say, we now trade more with the rest of the world than we do with the European Union, um, and that's been growing. Um, and countries like China and India are growing much faster than the European Union. Um, the EU is backward, inward-looking, shrinking relative to the rest of the world. Our future is outside. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. The um, way that the people on the EU campaign will, uh, um, uh, will present it is to say, well, first of all, as I said before, uh, the EU still remains by far our largest single trading partner. Um, but second, that membership of the European Union hasn't stopped us growing our exports to other countries. Uh, in fact, it's gone along quite healthily with growing our exports to other countries. And indeed, many countries within the EU uh, do rather better than we do um, at exporting to uh, places like China and India. So I think Germany exports about three times as much from China as we do. And clearly, being part of the European Union hasn't stopped them doing it. Why should it stop us doing it? Um, so that is, those are uh, some of the arguments that, that, uh, that will be put forward. Um, so, the next one, this is an illustration of some work we did uh, um, at NISA, actually before I arrived, uh, back at the time when uh, um, the UK was discussing whether or not to join the, uh, the Euro. Uh, but this is about the impact of, of withdrawing from the EU. So this looks at, um, and this is an example of economic forecasting, um, using a specific counterfactual, in other words, saying what precisely the two different scenarios were and trying to evaluate uh, what the different impacts are. So we try to look at, under a variety of assumptions, as I won't spell out now, what would happen to investment from abroad, FDI, foreign direct investment, that's people who come here and spend money building factories, uh, say like the Nissan factory in Sunderland, which is one of the UK's more successful foreign direct investment. That's a country from outside the European Union spending money here because they want to take advantage of building things here, cars in this case, for the European Union market. So what we found was that uh, leaving the, uh, um, uh, the EU would probably result in a reduction in foreign direct investment. Companies like this would be less keen on investing here. Um, and that would in turn reduce GDP, reduce our economic output. So we found that over about uh, um, 10 years, uh, that would depress uh, GDP by about 2%. In other words, we'd be, we'd be about 2% poorer from this one particular aspect of the European Union um, if we left. Uh, and I think you know, we are going to revisit that sort of work now, because this was 10 years ago, lots of things have changed. 
Uh, and it, I, I think, again, the important thing to remember, this, this is an example of how you do forecasting properly. That is, you have to specify two different scenarios, try to work out what would happen under each one, and look at the difference. But it, is, it still is in the science. Do we know if this is right or wrong? We, we don't. We think it's based on sensible assumptions and there's a reasonable projection. It gives a good way of thinking about the possible impacts on, on the economy if we were to leave the European Union. But um, it's perfectly possible to take uh, to, 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 to analyze these things in a different way. Um, but these, I think, are the, the sort of arguments that we have that will be made during the, uh, during the referendum campaign. Um, immigration, or free movement of workers. Um, and this is just an illustration of, the, uh, uh, of just how important uh, this has been to the development of the UK economy, um, in particular uh, since about the mid-1990s. So this shows the dotted line is the uh, share of people who were born abroad in the working age population. So you can see that back in the 1980s when I first joined the labour market, um, about 7% of, of the working age population was born abroad. Um, that started going up in the mid-1990s, and then it accelerated after 2004 when Eastern European countries joined the European Union. So we now have about 15%, is probably a little higher now, almost one in six of the working age population, almost one in six of uh, 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 people of between the ages of 16 and 65. Uh, uh, were born outside the UK. Um, and that's unprecedented in British economic history and it's had a pretty profound effect on how our labour market operates. Uh, the other line shows the share in new jobs, that is the proportion of people being recruited to a job who are for, were born outside the European Union. You can see that line pretty much cracks it, but it's somewhat higher uh, because immigrants tend to move jobs more quickly. So what that means is that about one in six, probably now almost closer to one in five. One in five of every new job created goes to somebody who was born abroad. Um, so these are pretty big numbers uh, for the British labour market. What would be the impact on the UK economy um, if we were to leave the European Union? And as a consequence, we had a much more restricted immigration policy, especially to people from within Europe. Uh, well, uh, this is something I've done a lot of research on, and I won't. I'll spare you the details for the moment. Uh, but on the whole, that most economists think that, that uh, this level of immigration has been pretty good for the UK labour market. Um, it's made us uh, more efficient and more productive. Um, and at the same time, it's done that without significantly reducing job opportunities for British workers. And in fact, of course, uh, there are more British people in jobs than ever before, just as there are more uh, um, non-British born people in jobs than ever before. So on the whole, we tend to think that it is beneficial and that uh, withdrawing from it, it, the, the substantial reduction in immigration would be bad for the UK labour market. Of course, there are some, many wider impacts on immigration on things like public services, uh, tax receipts, and so on. Uh, uh, again, most economists tend to think that those are probably overall, on average, uh, relatively beneficial, uh, somewhat in contrast to the general public debate among politicians. Uh, but there's plenty more room for more analysis there. I'm sure we'll be hearing quite a bit more on immigration in particular uh, um, in the run-up to the referendum. Um, so I'm going to uh, round it off there, um, just about half an hour. Um, and uh, I've covered a, an awful lot of material there uh, um, in, a, in quite a short time. Um, there is, uh, say, there will be a, a huge amount more of coverage on this. Um, in the press and on, on television. Much of it, as I say, will be nonsense. Um, but it is a, uh, um, I would highly recommend paying attention to it, uh, uh, to reading what is said on the, or watching what is said and trying to, if only uh, so that you get an idea of how to distinguish between sense and nonsense um, in the public and, and political debate. Uh, it's a really important skill. So when somebody says, you know, we'd be three thousand pounds a year worse off, or nine hundred pounds a year better off, or whatever it is, that type of thing, to try and understand what that statement might mean, why it probably doesn't make sense as it was then, but how you would actually think about trying to answer the question in a more sensible way, 
uh, of what the impact of living here is meaning work, for example. Okay, I'll um, just take the opportunity to thank Jonathan for coming in today to talk to us about, I'm finished it, talk to us about economics um, and give us a detailed analysis of whether we should or the economic implications of joining. I think also what was great, if you were listening very carefully, was the nuance by which he was analysing the data. So this is great for your studies because this is how you should be approaching things with a critical mind and a critical um, eye when you're looking at these different points of uh, view. So please join with me one more time to thank uh, Jonathan for coming in today.